Scripture reading is from Psalm 104, 24 to 35. O Lord, how many fold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open their open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I'll sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. The sermon title is, as you see on your bulletin, is Revival. Say it with me, Revival. <laughs> revival. So uh, the literal meaning of Revival is, as you also see in the bulletin, um, at the title section, that means making something alive again. So I hope and pray that God will make things, you know, make our souls, make this church alive again and um, and a heart for God uh, alive again. So, but first, let me ask a question. So when you hear this word revival, what really comes to your mind? Revival. What's your understanding of revival? Or do you have any personal experience of revival? Yes, Anthony. You know, basically means something is coming back. Okay, coming back. Yeah. Have, do you have any experience of that? No? Maybe today. <laughs> okay. All right. And um, so what does it really, this is something I want to, um, I want all of us to delve into and ponder about, you know, what does it really mean to have a revival? And as mentioned earlier, today is Pentecost Sunday, and fundamentally it's about revival. Now, Pentecost is the day we Christians remember and celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is the day God poured out His Spirit upon the Jerusalem church. And to those like people like us, you know, who have the same nature, who have same per you know, similar personalities like some of us, you know, this Holy Spirit came upon them. And once the Holy Spirit came upon them, they received this power. They received this gifts, came from above, and they received this heart, new heart, new spirit. God said, you know, I'll remove the heart of stone. I will put a new heart, new spirit within you. And then they, you know, start worshiping God passionately. You know, they love extravagantly and witness Jesus boldly. So every time I revisit the story of Pentecost Day, it really exhilarates my heart. It inspires my heart, and I hope it does it to you, to you as well, because Pentecost basically tells us two things. Number one is God's promise is being fulfilled. Jesus, over and over, He, he said to His disciples, right? You know, I, I go to the Father so that the, you will receive the Holy Spirit. He gave this promise that one day, God will give you the Holy Spirit. And indeed, His promise was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit really came upon them, as Jesus said, not on their agenda, not on their timing, not on their expectation, but according to God's timing, according to God's ways. For the truth to be t told, you know, it really did come. So this story reminds us one thing clear, that this same promise can happen in our day and time, and even in our place, because God's promises the same yesterday today and tomorrow our God is same yesterday today and tomorrow and you know God's promise is faithful you know it is indomitable it is trustworthy so once Jesus said you will receive it it means we can be that person we can be that church we can receive what God has promised 
Let's receive. We can receive the power. So I think every time I just revisit story, it kind of excites me, and wonder, God, when? <laughs> God, I want. I want it. You know. And I hope you excites you as well. Number two, what this story of Pentecost tells us that there is something far greater than what we have today. If you're like me, you may have this hunger, or you may have this yearning. You know, thinking about our church, thinking about our faith journey. There gotta be something more than this. What I'm experiencing now in this worship, there gotta be something more than this. What we are seeing in this church, there gotta be something more than this. When we hear this message, or when we read the Bible, you may wonder there gotta be something more than this. What I'm sensing right now, and also talking about our lives, Christian life, when we go into the world interacting with other people, there gotta be something more than what how we. Present or how we demonstrate our faith to the world, something remarkably more than what I am today. Because when when it comes to our faith, it's all about God, Almighty God, God of wonders, God of miracles, God of you know nothing's impossible with God. So there gotta be much more. And and thinking about this, God chose me, God saved me. The Bible says through Jesus Christ. Now, we inherit this kingdom of God that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for me. So no matter what's going on in our lives, just believing and knowing what's ahead of me, our hearts supposed to be filled with this inexpressible joy and unshakable peace. And my life ought to be demonstrating this fearless and unwavering faith in God to the world. So again, Pentecost invites us to have this visible picture. Of once Holy Spirit comes, once we receive this power, you know we what is being lost can be restored, and you know we may we may restore what it ought to be, and make our faith alive again, so that you and I, I'm thinking of Ezekiel 37, you know, dry bones become God's exceedingly great army of God. You know, we we made that kind of church. We made individuals. You know, we made that kind of, you know. The, um, The figures as presented in the Bible. So Pentecost fundamentally is about revival. And what is revival? Uh, first, let me tell you what is not revival. Okay, more people coming to the church. The church budget is growing. Purchasing a new church building and expanding our ministry. We tend to think these are the revivals, but that's not true. They are simply the byproducts of revival. For example, once you eat cookies, let's say chocolate chip cookie, what happens? You may have cookie crumbs, right? And cookie crumbs are not the main, right? If you choose cookie crumbs over the real chocolate chip cookie, you may be foolish, right? And these cookie crumbs are like all this list that I listed before. The real cookie, the real and true revival is this. It's all of, all about God. God. You know, people start like wondering, like, God, I want you. I want nothing else but you. People start hungry and yearning for God's words and presence. People start sensing how broken they are, how sinful they are, and therefore how desperately needy they are for God's grace and forgiveness. So they boast nothing but the cross. They tremble for God's wrath and judgment. They praise God for His redemption. To save a person like me, a wretched man or woman who deserves nothing but the death in hell and despair. So that's the essence of revival. So revival is not really about beautiful music or having a full concert band. You know, I mean, we recently had a wonderful musicians you know, right at this place, Clay and Renee uh, Crosse. I mean, revival is not really about this talented, gifted. Musicians, nor it's about you know the inspirational sermon. It is because once you look at the real revivals, to name a few that happened in our recent history, like the Welsh revival in 1904, Ajusa Street in 1906, or Pyongyang revival in 1907, and the most recent revival that probably you heard of, you know, that happened about a year ago at this small town in Wilmore, Kentucky. People recall it was. The day that had nothing peculiar, it was just a regular chapel service at this Asbury University. Some students thought 
this church, this worship is dead. There's nothing like vibrancy in this worship. And even the preacher who gave the word at this chapel, he, he came down from the pulpit thinking, oh, I, I spoiled my sermon. So there was no element anybody could claim, you know what, what we have experienced it here, this revival is because of me, it's because of my music, it's because of my sermon, it's because of this or that. No, nobody can say that. And yet in this very unlikely moment and place, the Holy Spirit poured out upon them. And once the Holy Spirit came, the students, they started confessing their sins, one after another. They stood up, I have confession to make. I have addiction with this. I have a depression problem. I need some help. I'm lonely, I'm lost. They hunger for God's grace. They pray for one another. They praise the Lord for the grace and redemption that was given to those who humbly ask. So these students did not want to leave the chapel room because they want more of God's presence. God was enough. Just like Psalm 104, 27, 28 says today, these all fixed their hearts to God and indeed God gave them and they are filled with good things. They found shalom in God's presence. So even though no one asked them to do so, but these college students, early 20s or 19 something, they voluntarily and so desperately remained in the chapel to be in the presence of the Lord asking God, I want you more. And it lasted for the next 11 days. And that's the cookie I'm talking about. That's the essence of revival. The people seek nothing else but God. People want God's presence. And the cookie crumbs you know, are more and more people came in, just hearing about this, what's happening at Asbury campus. You know, they got all the spotlights from the from the world, all the media talking about, oh, there's something miraculous thing, something mir you know mysterious thing going on, and people start joining in. And but that was not the essence. None of them was their goal. The true revival is God Himself, the glory of God. So if anybody asks, like, what's the purpose of revival? The answer is for God's glory alone. Revival is nothing about us. It's nothing about you or me. It's nothing about the numbers. How many people show up? How many offer, How much offerings do we get? That's more of a business mindset, isn't it? Hear me this. There is a big difference between human-generated revival and God-generated revival. The former is obsessed with the numbers. It's more like an investment. We've done this much. We spent this much. So we ought to have this much. It's like give and take. If we're not getting enough, according to our expectation, we may think we've failed. We are disappointed. But when it comes to God-generated revival, we don't really, the numbers don't really bother us. We just give, we spend, we offer, we even surrender all to God. Even if, even if the number is not quite impressive in human standpoint, Nothing would bother us because we will be still thrilled. Our hearts are full and we have become exceedingly joyful. Why? Because we know and we have God in and among us. And how do we know God is in our midst? When we see the true repentance, when we see a sinner turn from their sins and set free from the bondage of their sins by the blood of Jesus, when we see God revives our souls, when we see God restore the brokenhearted, when we see God binds the wounds and sorrows in our lives and bring the dead to life, by which people may sing, Holy, Holy, Almighty. Yesterday, I had a leadership meeting uh, for the young adult group. So I serve on you know, Sunday afternoons, I go to Maryland side and um, I serve this young adult group. So once a, once a month, we have a leadership meeting um, and in the meeting, we talk about these two little girls uh, who came to the Mother's Day worship service last Sunday. So they had an uh, all-congregation worship service. So I noticed that there are new, two new faces, little girls, on the pew. And uh, so we talked about them, and I learned 
that they um, and I also noticed that they were um, they were not with their, their parents. They came by themselves and followed their um, friends who were attending the service. And I also heard this two little ones, like six or seven graders. You know, they are growing in a broken home. And hearing this, my heart just broke for them because they were just little kids, but um, who are, you know, who've been just exposed to not so favorable condition in their lives. But anyway, so later while we were praying, the Holy Spirit led me to pray like this, God, what we are doing here, this church is not really about numbers, isn't it, God? How many people show up every Sunday? I don't think that's what you really care. Well, wow, God, you really care is how much these broken souls, souls will find you and will find the one true Father in heaven who dearly loves them and pursues them. So I pray for these little two, one, two little ones that they may know you and they may know that there is greater love pursuing them so that whatever the scars and binds and wounds they may have will be healed. And I pray, God, that these people will be like wounded healers, that they will grow in your image. And once they grow up, they can heal the broken and wounded people in this world. If you are seeking revival at Smith Chapel, what kind of revival are we talking about here? It is about God who dearly loves us so that he sent his son to heal and forgive and feed the hungry and revive the dying people like you and me. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Lastly, um, how can we have revival? I mean, we talk about revival and we, you know, the urgency of having the revival. But how, we, how can we have the revival? Two things. Number one, we must remember that revival comes from God, not from us. Say with me, revival comes from God. Thank you. Luke, what Jesus said regarding the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 1, 8 says, he said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Here, I want you to circle this word, receive. Thank God, because he did not say, you have to generate, you have to make, you have to create this power. No, you just have to receive it. We cannot create what is supernatural. Supernatural has come from the supernatural. And that's what Jesus said. In the same token, Jesus also said, this would happen when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, this will happen when the hands of the Lord will come upon you. When God wills, when God desires, when God blows the wind, this will happen. Always, 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 the work of the revival comes from God, not the other way around. Remember, revival begins from God and it ends with God. And God is the creator and the finisher. Jesus is Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. So in revival, we mortals have nothing to claim but glorify God alone. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we should sit back and do nothing and be lazy about what God is doing. That's not what Bible says. Bible says we reap what we saw. If you want revival, if that's what really you really think that we need, if that's what we really desire, then we have a job to do. Jesus kindly put it this way. He said, ask, seek, knock. He said, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find a knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of fish, giving him a serpent? Or if, if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more 
Will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. When the first Pentecost come, came, in other words, when God allowed, when God blow this new wind, you know, this first revival you know, to these people, it came in a very unlikely place, you know, an attic. It wasn't a hundred thousand people accommodating stadium with full worship band. Not even an evangelist was there, but to those 120 people who desperately and urgently prayed and prayed and prayed with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, trusting in the faithfulness of Jesus' promise that our Heavenly Father will give what they ask. And boom, right? The Holy Spirit came. God surprised them. And I, I think that's the kind of surprise we need. Right? There got to be something more, God, isn't it? God, is what we see, what we experience, what we taste. I truly believe there got to be far greater things what we are seeing and, and experiencing. We're talking about sovereign God. We're talking about God of wonders, our living God, supernatural power. And recently, we had a wonderful worship concert, right, guys? Amen? <laughs> Amen. One of my highlights of this concert, the entire thing, you know, preparing and just having it and even afterwards, is to witness that how our God is faithful. My heart, you know, even, even right now, filled with this gratitude to see how God provides and establishes and, and of course, as we know, you know, we had the moments, right? We had, we all had moments together when many of us had to struggle, like, especially when musician, like even, it was only five days before we had concert and he had to cancer coming and we were kind of bummed, like, what should we do? Like right in front of the member hall, right? Like we were holding our hands, I guess. We were just talking to each other. God, what God may provide and and also the weather, right? It did not turn out as we expected. But in hindsight, everything just worked out all good. And, and we all tasted joy and sweet Holy Spirit filling us and reviving us. And thanks be to God. So Linda asked me, so how long are you going to put the string lights here? I don't know. I just want to keep the <laughs> vibes here and we'll see. Maybe we should have another worship concert here, amen? Yeah. But how these, these wonderful things come together, put together so wonderfully and powerfully, we can credit, we can give credit to many different things. But I want to give credit to our prayers. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Some of us here came on Thursday evenings you know, just to pray for the concert. We spent a, more than an hour just praying, praying, praying. You know, from little things to big things. We gather, you know, we sat on the gazebo, we sat around, we stand around, the, stood around the fire pit. We pray for God's blessings for this concert. And I know, like many of you, you prayed where you were for the concert. And I heard people from other churches. The Korean church I serve in Maryland, I just learned this week that while we were having the concert, I mean, on the day, you know, some of the members of that church, they were, they were having this another gathering and they were talking about our concert. Oh, Pastor Ho and their church is having this concert today, but it's raining, we should pray for them. <laughs> there was another prayer, you know, coming in for this worship. And also my mom from South Korea, you know, she'd been praying for this concert. So my point is, how this you know concert wonderfully and so beautifully put together uh, all because of our prayers if we want revival if we want to see some miraculous some marvelous some remarkable thing that is guaranteed our father in heaven is willing to give the best gift to those who ask which is the holy spirit and our, our God's promise is so faithful, never fails. If you want to receive them, our job is to pray. 
So let me say this word and wrap up our message today. Now for Christians, Sunday is really special, right? And there are many, there could be many reasons, but I will say three reasons why Sunday is special and why do we worship on Sundays? Number one, because on this very day, Pentecost came. It was on Sunday. It was the first day of the week. God poured out His Spirit upon His people on this day. On top of that, we know that on this day, Jesus rose from the dead. And also on this day, first day of the week, God created light, right? They all happen on Sunday. So I pray with some excitement and some trembling hearts. Our Father in heaven will give us the Holy Spirit as we ask and seek and knock so that this house of the Lord and it's one of us, our little children, everybody will be filled with light, filled with the life and filled with the power. So, that's, and so let's continue to pray and believe and even be excited because our God is faithful and what He has promised, He will surely do it in His appointed time. So I bless Ms. Chapel and each one of you that we can receive that power as the Holy Spirit will come upon us so that you and I will be that witness you know, who will worship God passionately, love extravagantly, and witness Jesus boldly here in Great Falls and DC metro area and to the end of the earth. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. Let's pray. I want to spend some time to pray and just thinking about the message today. God, that's what I need. That's what my church needs. That's what my, my son, my daughter, that's my, my parents, my neighbors, that's my community, that's my nation. That's what this world needs. Um, so let's pray. Um, you know, God gives more generously than we ask. So let's, um, let's continue to pray. Um, but before that, I have one more thing. So speaking of that prayer, this is one challenge and also encouragement um, that I would like to suggest for our congregation that um, so if the Holy Spirit is willing and in my heart, you know, and also my wife, we talk about this, maybe we should start a Friday evening prayer meeting. You know, we gather at the gazebo. Uh, I mean, these days we have a beautiful weather and we've done some pest, pest, pest control, no mosquitoes, <laughs> I hope. So we can gather at, you know, the gazebo Friday, 7.30 for about an hour. We just gather, we praise, we, we sing songs and we pray just for the revival of our church, revival of our nation revival of our individual souls. So on Friday evening, you know, I, I want to challenge maybe starting this week, okay? Starting this week, all are welcome, our children, everybody just gather. In Jesus' name we pray, pray, pray for the revival. And if the Lord willing, we can have pray to worship once a month on Friday night or bi-monthly you know, at this place we're outside that we can just continue to pray and seek God and at just the right time, in God's appointed time, He will pour out His Spirit and shake the world <laughs> and, um, and, and, and bless, bless His people. Amen? So let, for that, let's pray together, okay? Let's, um, let's pray, God, Holy Spirit, you no, know, um, please give us the right hearts, you know, put us the right spirit and um, even to our children, you know, God, just speak to them. You know, let them be excited. God, there are, there are so much more in your name. You know, let's see visions. You know, our opening scripture today, you know, when God poured out his spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men and women shall dream dreams. And your young men and women shall see visions. God, could you show us some visions? Could you show, you know, give us some hearts? 
can exhilarate us and they can excite us, they can revive our souls more burning for you and your kingdom and Jesus you conquered the world that's the Lord we are following we are worshiping so um, just give us uh, some visions and um, and right heart right spirit so that uh, we may follow and worship you you know that and and all the things that we do will be pleasing to you so um, let's pray and